setting up here. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm Jay Remley. I'm chairman of the board for the Lupus Foundation and uh, excited here to host another Office Hours with Dr. Sean Parsa. And we have another special guest uh, this morning with us, Dr. Mel Balboni, known as Dr. Balboni or Dr. Mel, maybe from her uh, pediatric patients. Um, Dr. Balboni is with Lucille Packard Children's Hospital uh, at Stanford Children's Health. And we're, uh, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Balboni. She's been a huge supporter and um, advocate for the Lupus Foundation in Northern California. And it's fantastic to have both uh, you, uh, Dr. Parsa, as always, and our special guest here with uh, Dr. Balboni. And so before we get started, I wanted to just remind everybody, feel free to share your um, questions through our Facebook Live uh, page. You can also email us at communications at lfnc.org uh, with any questions you know, along the way. If you want to ask them here during our Facebook Live uh, office hours uh, or afterwards, and we'll follow up. So we have a few questions from our previous um, office hours that we had with Dr. Parsa. But today, we've, we are going to uh, have a, a key topic around, and the reason Dr. Balboni is joining us, around pediatric lupus. Um, there's, uh, you know, lupus uh, impacts not just, you know, 90% of lupus patients are women, uh, but it, not just adults, right? It also impacts uh, children as well at fairly young ages. And we've had quite a few questions that have come through the foundation over the last few months. And so we want to hit on uh, that topic for sure this morning. And then there's been a couple other questions that have come through around just the latest in COVID research uh, and the impact of that with the lupus community, as well as just the the progress we're making as a as a nation, as a as a global society around the the vaccinations and the progress we're making there. So we'll touch on a few questions on that topic as well. So with that, we'll jump in here. And uh, again, Dr. Parsa, Dr. Balboni, thank you so much for uh, joining us and supporting the Lupus Foundation as always. It's a um, having you know having us here. Thank you so much, Jay, for the support of the Lupus Foundation and the Lupus Patient. And we're just uh, honored to have Dr. Balboni here with us uh, today. Likewise, yeah, no, absolutely. Happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Balboni. Yes, uh, we've been doing this for probably close to a year now. We really started these office hours as we got into COVID. Hard to believe it's been a little over a year. And um, we try to do them every other week. So, you know, stay in touch with uh, the Lupus Foundation, either through email or online at our website, lfnc.org, and you'll, uh, or our Facebook page, and you'll see um, the scheduled office hours coming up here in the future. Um, okay, so let's let's kick it off here. Um, we're going to try to keep this to about 30 minutes, maybe 40 at the most. Um, both Dr. Balboni and Dr. Parsa are obviously practicing physicians and have a crazy busy schedule, and so we'll try to keep this to 30 to, to 40 minutes here, as I mentioned. So, Dr. Balboni, this first question around pediatric lupus. Um, what are the signs and symptoms of lupus in uh, children? And what should maybe parents or, or significant, you know, others, relatives look for? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think many people know lupus actually can cause many different symptoms. Some people even say it's the uh, great imitator. Um, and that makes it actually sometimes really challenging to make the diagnosis because you can have a wide variety of symptoms. So some of our patients present with fevers and rashes or joint pain. Um, other patients might not have that at all, but present with more significant involvement, like um, their kidneys being affected or other organ system involvement. So um, it can be a challenge. And I think that's why it's important, um, you know, for primary care providers, your pediatricians to you know, be in contact with us if they have any questions or concerns, unusual symptoms that maybe you might think is just an ordinary viral infection or some other temporary illness, but it's going on for longer. You know, you always have to keep in the back of your mind that there could be something like lupus going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good. Um, 
Yeah, it's it definitely can mask itself. We hear that from a lot of patients of all ages. It's it's very commonly misdiagnosed because of that. And uh, so, yeah, I guess you know, be be diligent and continue to you know um, dig in with your prime with your physician and, and and pediatrician and so forth, pediatric lupus physician like Dr. Balboni here to um, really get to the root cause of what might be going on. And so with that, you know, if, if the child is diagnosed with um, lupus, what are some of the treatments that you're seeing today and, and are recommending? Yeah, so it really depends on what type of organ system involvement a lupus patient has. So um, some patients might have pretty mild disease. Um, and if it's arthritis, um, you know, and they don't have kidney problems, we might start with something as simple as what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or naproxen. Um, and that can work for some patients for arthritis. Um, most of our patients go on a drug called hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, which actually was originally uh, developed as an anti-malarial drug and found to later work very well to help um, treat lupus, especially if it's um, skin disease, but also to help keep lupus patients from flaring. So most patients are on that medication unless they have some contraindication or reason not to be on it. Um, but if you have a more moderate to severe disease, most patients do end up needing stronger medicines that help sort of calm that immune uh, system down because we know lupus is Basically, if you want to think about it, your immune system becoming a little bit overactive and attacking yourself rather than just fighting bad foreign things. And so sometimes we, many patients require steroids such as prednisone mm -hmm. or even, you know, I, IV doses. Um, and if you have more uh, severe organ involvement, then we have other medicines that really suppress the immune system more strongly. So it really does depend on um, every patient. And um, I like to say, which is what I was trained by my mentor is you've seen one lupus patient, you've seen one lupus patient. So every patient is different. Um, and we're able to tailor yeah. our treatments to, you know, the risk benefit of the risks of the medicine to, you know, being able to control the, the disease based on how severe it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, just personal experience on that one. You know, my, my wife was um, misdiagnosed with lupus uh, when she was 13 and missed quite a bit of school. And back then, this was in the mid '80s. It wasn't as well known, and it's great to see and hear the progress that we've made, you know, as a as a medical and just lupus community as a whole. And then she had another flare ten years later when she was 23, and then formally or clinically diagnosed, you know, with lupus. But again, that's when the steroids were, you know, part of the treatment and Plaquenil. And still to this day, you know, she's on on Plaquenil, so um, doing very well. But to your point in that first, you know, comment you made, it's often masks itself. It's challenging. You see one patient, you've only seen one patient. Every patient is so different. And it was part of the just personal experience with my, with my wife. You know, she was diagnosed, you know, not diagnosed. She had it when she was 13, but never formally diagnosed or treated for it. And then finally, when she was 23, she was. Um, so fantastic. Um, thank you for that uh, update. And then one other, um, maybe one other, one other question here, just to follow on to that is, um, you know, those are some of the treatments and so forth with, you know, pediatric lupus, but as a, as maybe a parent or a, a caregiver, what, um, how can they help, you know, a child with lupus? So once they're diagnosed, they're being treated, what are some things that you recommend for the support group or the parents, you know, with uh, children that have been diagnosed with lupus? Oh, there's, there's so many things to consider. Um, I mean, I I think one thing that I tell all of my parents and, and all of my patients is that, you know, this is a chronic illness. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have a cure, but we do have great medications that the majority of our patients will do well. But especially in the beginning, it, it's a hard road. And having the emotional support is as important as the medical treatments. And so, um, you know, being a teenager, being a, a child these days is hard enough, but then you throw in a chronic illness that can cause uh, you to look differently. Medications can have side effects. So there's a lot of emotional uh, and psychological stressors. So I think being strong and um, kind of, I want to say, holding it together for your child is really important, but also um, encouraging uh, 
seeking support if needed. Um, you know, and if I had my way, all of my patients would be in, have a therapist of some sort to just talk about living with a chronic illness, um, you know, and, and having that support. Um, and I think it also is important to support siblings or other family members who don't have the disease, because sometimes you see that, you know, the child that is affected, you know, their sibling may feel kind of left out. So making sure the whole family is emotionally healthy, as healthy as possible, yeah. um, is really important. Um, so yeah. that would be one major thing. Yeah, yeah the support is really important. Uh, we, we, um, just, you know, personally, you know, going through, you know, with my wife as we've, you know, uh, lived with lupus and then same thing with the lupus foundation. We, we stood up a, um, what we call the lupus buddy program. And it was really just for that purpose is, you know, pairing, you know, individuals up that were recently diagnosed with someone that's maybe been living with lupus for five, 10, 15 years and have, finding a way to provide, you know, that level, a different level of support or, or different areas of support because it is so, so important, um, you know, to have, you know, other, just an outlet to people to talk to, people that have maybe have been through this before. And the Lupus Buddy Program has really taken off for us. Um, hundreds of, you know, pairs of individuals of recently diagnosed paired up with, you know, those that are living with lupus. And it's really just a great, what we get, what we get feedback on is really just a, an, another individual to listen, you know, to talk to and to listen. And especially for individuals that have been through maybe this already, hearing their experience and, you know, knowing that there is treatment, we are getting better at this uh, as a community and in supporting it and, and living with lupus. So. And I, I will say um, that uh, one of the things that we often offer to our patients is, um, you know, because pediatric lupus is even more rare than lupus in general is, you know, there may not be um, somebody that, you know, that has lupus, but if we, you know, we have a parent or a patient that we know is, you know, has been through this, we'll actually offer, obviously asking that parent first, you know, for them to reach out to our patients as well, because I think it really does help to, to talk to someone. And we've referred, definitely referred people to the Lupus Buddy uh, program, because I think that really uh, provides a lot of support. Having people who have been through it um, with such a rare disease is important. Yeah, yeah. No, for, for sure. And yeah, we found um, great success with that. And it's, it's helpful too, to have, you know, um, physicians like yourself that uh, can, you know, provide that input and then refer, you know, patients to the lupus buddy program as a, as another alternative, right. For support. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, let me, let me shift gears. Um, Dr. Parsa, we had a, a question, a uh, couple of questions come in recently around the COVID-19 and, and the vaccine. And let me, um, let me shift a question over to here. Let me pull up, you know, the question that came through. Uh, it's really around the um, antibodies, uh, especially for patients that have um, received uh, the vaccine. And what uh, what are some of the question is really what are the options for patients if they don't have the antibodies? from the vaccine or maybe after the, after getting the vaccine aren't showing signs of antibodies. Any, any feedback or um, thoughts you have on that question? Uh, generally speaking, uh, we're not checking the antibody for the, the general population to just make sure that, you know, they had uh, 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 enough response on uh, producing antibody against uh, uh, the COVID. But in some circumstances, maybe the healthcare workers that you know they're constantly in contact with the patients, maybe working in the ER or just uh, uh, first responders, uh, uh, if they're checking you know their antibody and it doesn't show that the antibody is in the uh, in the system, uh, then the recommendation for these subgroup of the people is just getting another round of the uh, uh, the vaccine and with the hope to get the antibody for the, but for the general population, we're not recommending to track and, you know, check if the antibody is there. Um, so uh, one of the symptoms, if the patient is having symptoms, symptomatic reaction to the vaccine, that might be suggesting that the immune response uh, has been there. But again, we're, we're just generally speaking, 
where it's not a guide part of the guideline to check if the antibody was produced or not, unless, you know, it's a special circumstances, you know, healthcare providers, first responders, that they're constantly in contact with the group of people that might have the COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. In those subgroup, we might check it, you know, and considering doing it. And in case that the antibody is not, not there, we'll go with the second round of the vaccine for them, but not for the general population. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Parsa. Um, any, uh, you know, as we move, and this is just more of a, as you were, both of you were talking here, um, a question that came to mind, you know, obviously on, on the topic of the vaccine and pediatric lupus, you know, obviously the vaccine now is, is becoming available, you know, more and more, you know, for uh, the children and teenagers. Uh, I think it's coming up now down to, to age 12. Any, um, any thoughts or feedback that uh, either of you have maybe for parents um, with, with teenagers and uh, potentially with an autoimmune disease like lupus and, and, and um, the pros and cons or your recommendations around the vaccine? I know this is top of mind for a lot of parents. Yeah, um, so we are recommending that any of our patients that um, meet the qualifications being 12, uh, and up do get vaccinated. Um, and, you know, there have been some guidelines that have come out from the American College of Rheumatology um, around vaccinations and the pros and cons. Um, I think one of the concerns everybody has is that because our patients often are on medicines that suppress the immune system, that maybe you might not mount as good of a response as someone who's not on those medicines. But we feel that, you know, even even if it's not as good of a response, if you get some immune response to the vaccine, that that's worth it. Um, obviously, we always do worry, could a vaccine, you know, trigger a flare or trigger some kind of adverse reaction, but we know that even the infection itself could do that. And, you know, it's in our minds safer to have that vaccine and have the protection and hopefully participate in, in making herd immunity so that in the future, there'll be less of a risk. So we are recommending for most of our patients um, that they do get the vaccine. I think if somebody is very, very ill, say they're just diagnosed and on a lot of medicines, um, you know, that would be a discussion to have with, with their provider. Um, but if someone is doing well, stable on, you know, their medications that we do recommend it. Okay, very good. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Robona. Yeah, it's a very common question we get, uh, especially, you know, for lupus patients and, you know, the vaccine. Um, one other, so one other question coming back um, to, uh, you know, the pediatric lupus, but also just, um, you know, the lupus community at large, you know, 90% of lupus patients are uh, women. And uh, one of the questions that has come through is, you know, can women with lupus have children? So kind of bridging these two topics together here, you know, parents and, and pediatric lupus. Um, any thoughts on, I'll tee that up for, for either one of you here as far as, you know, women with lupus, um, you know, having children, likelihood of having children, things to think about, you know, uh, if, if you're a, a female with lupus and, and want to have children. You want me to start? Um, Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, for sure, uh, uh, women uh, with lupus can have successful pregnancies. Um, I think in the old days, you know, before when I was maybe still a child or many years ago, um, there was concern, you know, that given the fact that more women have lupus, maybe pregnancy wasn't recommended. Um, and, you know, I think we've come a long way in our treatments and our ability to control the disease. What I tell my patients, and of course, you know, as they're entering, you know, later adolescence and, and transitioning to the adult world, you know, they need to know that um, having lupus doesn't mean they can't have children, but it does mean they need to take special precautions. Um, I think it's really important to have your disease well controlled um, and be sure that the medications you're on, and this is a discussion with your providers, you know, are not toxic um, or cause uh, problems with um, pregnancy. So making sure you're in the right place and having 
Um, a good obstetrician, we generally recommend our patients be followed by what's called a high-risk obstetrician, so they're familiar with some of the complications that you might have with lupus. Um, and then there are some uh, antibodies that patients with lupus can, pr uh, that they can um, produce that can cause complications for the fetus. And so I just have a very frank discussion with my patients and make sure that they're aware of that and make sure um, that when they are deciding to have children that they're aware of those and are monitored appropriately for those um, antibodies and the complications that could occur. Yeah, just speaking from personal experience, as I mentioned before, and I'll, I'll ask Dr. Parse here if he has any additional comments, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my wife was diagnosed with lupus when she was, you know, 23, close to 24, and we're fortunate to have two healthy children. You know, she was 29 and 30, 31, almost 32, when our, our daughter, second child daughter was born. And it was, it was just considered, it was a high risk pregnancy, you know, considered a high risk pregnancy. So more frequent, you know, doctor visits, very close monitoring, you know, much more so throughout the pregnancy than, than maybe someone with, a, uh, you know, a mother without lupus, right, or not uh, with a chronic autoimmune disease. But um, definitely I can answer that question from personal experience at least, and um, we've successfully had two healthy children. So um, any other additional thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Parsa? I didn't want to move on there before uh, giving you a chance to also share any feedback. I think Dr. Uh, uh, already just explained everything really well. Uh, yes, it's a high risk pregnancy. It is possible, of course, you know, considering what kind of medication they're on and then having a discussion with the rheumatologist and the obstetrician, uh, in, uh, it's uh, possible. Of course, it's a high risk and all we need is just make sure that, you know, monitoring them more frequent and just, you know, Observe uh, just having you know like the evidences to make sure that the fetus is doing well, mom is doing well, and that's it. It's it's potentially possible uh, unless there is a special circumstances that you know uh, would be a discussion between the patient and the doctor to see if it's not a best thing to do. But for the most cases, uh, uh, it, it is potentially possible and uh, doable. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Parsa. Yeah, so I know we're coming up on our on our half hour here. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through our Facebook Live uh, channel um, or over um, email yet, but I'll just remind our, our viewers here that this will be posted, you know, obviously on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel, and you can always reach out to the Lupus Foundation uh, with any questions anytime. Uh, it's just communications at lfnc.org. Um, or you can visit us at lfnc.org, our website. Um, and we have a special page. It's lfnc.org backslash COVID-19, uh, COVID-19, and get any latest information that, um, that we're posting out there around research, any updates on you know, the vaccine, and most of it revolves, of course, around um, the lupus community or, or the healthcare community around autoimmune disease. So with that said, um, I think we'll wrap this one up. Um, I know, Dr. Balboni, you are on call, and, you know, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day, especially on your weekend of being on call, and uh, spending the time with us and answering a lot of the questions we have around um, pediatric lupus. And any questions that come through afterwards uh, for our audience here, keep them coming through and we will make sure to get those to Dr. Balboni and Dr. Parsa and get back to you uh, directly one-on-one -on -one or uh, either Dr. Balboni or Dr. Parsa will respond to your questions as well. So with that said, I just wanna thank uh, both of you again and we'll call this a wrap for our latest office hours uh, with the Lupus Foundation and really appreciate both of you taking your time here, especially on a Saturday uh, with us and with our lupus community. So with that, we'll, we'll sign off. Dr. Balboni, have a wonderful weekend. Same to you, Dr. Parsa, and look forward to seeing you both soon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.